Hello, I'm Doug, stand-up physicist, sitting down to reply to Matt the Beautiful Pavel Grunfeld's series on tensors, trying to argue that space-time numbers may be an upgrade. So he had a video where he talked about the gradient of a scalar function in just both, both normal coordinates and stretch coordinates. Now, I'd never dealt with stretch coordinates before, and I actually created a video, much like this one, except that one was wrong. <laughs> and um, I, I deleted it from uh, the good old internet, uh, and I'm try going to try in this one to, to actually get the stretch coordinates done correctly. Okay, so he talked about um, taking the good old gradient of a scalar function and you think well isn't that just what I was taught you know you take the partial derivative and let's say this is a function of just x and y uh, and so we got an i hat and then you take the derivative with respect to y in the j hat direction won't that just work well it will just work but will it also now work in stretch coordinates so what do we mean by, by that? So if this is just like a unit guy, what if this was our unit guy now? This is our primed frame. Let me write that, say, in red to keep it clear. And you go, hmm, what's the coordinate transformations for that? So, so you have good old x uh, becomes 2x prime. In other words, no, this is 4. 4x four prime. Because if this is 1x prime, that would be equivalent to 1, 2, 3, 4 of the, of the x's. Okay, so that's what it means to be stretched. Okay, we're also stretched in the y direction, but in a different amount. It's only 2. Okay, great. All right, so now we think about what's the gradient in this primed sort of thing. What is this beast? And uh, so you df prime, you can put primes everywhere. Oh, now instead of i hat, we actually ha have four i, I prime sort of thing. Oh, okay. Plus df prime, dy prime, uh, two j. And then you say, well, how about this derivative? And Pavel uh, shows that actually this doesn't get like smaller. This actually also gets larger too. <laughs> so you have this factor of another factor of four over here. And you have another factor of two here. And you go, oh, this isn't good. Because now this definition doesn't work. But fortunately, well, he fixed it. Well, kind of. Um, if you buy his book right here, no, all right, uh, and you go to, uh, right, it's right in the beginning, right in the beginning, and he points out um, that equation 1.6 here. Oh, there we go. Oh, actually, it's an erratum. <laughs> he, he added over the uh, absolute value of i over i, uh, i times i, when it's got to be the I over I squared. So if you put this over uh, I squared and this one over J squared, similarly for this, so our, our definitions are consistent, then, um, well, these are just one. Okay, these now bring in a 4 squared, 16, oh, 16 on this guy, this brings in a 4, hey, we're okay then. So let me just bring in, the, this goes at, uh, this brings in the 4, and that cancels out, this brings in a 16, those guys cancel out, and so we can say that those two are equivalent in either, um, stretched or non-stretched uh, kind of coordinate system. So I'm dealing with space-time numbers. How do they deal with this? Well, space-time numbers are very similar to quaternions, 
uh, actually, there's an equivalence relationship, so you can always get a quaternion out of the space-time number. But there are some important technical differences. Now, the way that Hamilton himself thought about a quaternion was he thought about it as a number, and actually, he didn't have this factor of e, but I'm going to add it for consistency. He thought about it as a vector space, as we say. Um, great. And what I am bothered by is, is this kind of this pairing of stuff. Because the A, it, the A, B, C, D, those are all real numbers, which actually have an awful lot of mathematical structure to them, enough to uh, do calculus, which is huge. And the basis vectors, those are totally different animal, okay? And I don't like that. I don't like putting something with a huge amount of structure next to this these basis vectors, which are that's there to, well, they're needed, okay? They're totally needed uh, in this approach. I want to treat the whole thing as a number and not have any basis vectors and go, go forward that way. Well, that's kind of strange exercise, but, um, and as a matter of fact, it brings up some notational issues. Like, I often use the word quaternion for space-time numbers. I, I actually use them mildly interchangeably. I ask my reader for some patience on that. Um, and I'll I sometimes like treat it as one whole unit. Okay. I'll sometimes write it as a kind of factor of two thing where, uh, and I often use the capital letters to, to imply this is a, a three, three vector sort of thing. I'll sometimes break it down into four parts. And if I really go the full space-time number sort of thing, I would write it as four doublets. But uh, let's go A and A prime, whatever. B and B prime. I hardly ever do this. You know, I actually think this, this, uh, this kind of notation is probably only going to matter for the strong force, which, like, nobody ever uses for anything other than, yeah, it's really important to keep the nucleus together. Um, so I'm just pointing that out. A bunch of different notations, it always means the same thing. Uh, something that doesn't have uh, basis uh, vectors um, to it. Okay, so that said, how am I going to deal with... Uh, with the gradient of a scalar function. Well, I always had to write this as, I guess in this case, I'll, I'll write it out in the four tuples kind of notation. And then I've got my function of just X and Y. It's a scalar function. So that's what I mean specifically. And that ends up being, when you multiply that out, you go uh, first times last. Oh, there's nothing. Oh, um, no, no. First, you multiply the first together. And the last minus the last. Oh, there's nothing. Then outside, nothing. Inside, that's the only thing. And then cross product, nothing. So the only thing you get out of here is d f d x, d, f, d, y, and 0. All right. Which, again, you can summarize as that. And a two, that means uh, the same thing. Okay. Great. Now we've got to deal with what happens in this primed frame. Okay. So we should write down a couple other things, and that is that d, x is going to equal 4 dx prime and dy is going to equal 4dy prime. Okay, so that means over here we have a 0 d4 dx prime and we, yeah, I got too many 4s going around, uh, d2 dy prime and I'm bringing the DZ along for the ride. Uh, F, again, I'm mixing max, 
missi mixing and matching notations. I hope you don't mind too much. Um, I hope you're a bright viewer. I, no doubt. All right. And um, so we go and apply this all. We get a zero. We got uh, one fourth the oh, F prime, the X prime, uh, a one half, the F prime, the Y prime, zero. And what we said was that that this is actually going to be four times as big as the not as that guy, and this is going to be two times as big, and we do that. And sorry, I shouldn't be wiping those out. Uh, and because of that, that wipes out, that wipes out, and we end up saying that that this is going to equal zero grad f. And it's the same thing as that one. And that's a great property. Uh, in fact, it's not a great property. It's a necessary property uh, of the gradient of a scalar function. So it can be done with space time numbers. And that's how you can do it. Okay, so that's all well and good. But then whenever I see all these zeros, I say, well, what's the, what's the complete story? And do we get some kind of interesting and fun mathematical physics if we don't have any zeros around okay so let's get let's get rid of the zeros and so uh let's go with a, t a differential operator let's go d by dt and we're going to use our two tuple notation instead of f we'll go with the greek kind of phi thing and we'll use an a and we just multiply this all out and that means you do first minus last d phi dt minus last, that's a uh, del dot, it is in the a. Then we do outy, d a dt, uh, any grad phi, oh, there's grad phi. <laughs> I knew it was in here somewhere. <laughs> and then the uh, curl of a. That's great. All right. So, bunch of letters has no physical meaning only actually it does if you've taken electromagnetism because you go hey this part that is minus the electric field and this part that is the b field it's like hold it we weren't doing physics we were <laughs> We're doing the gradient of a scalar function. I just wiped out the zeros, uh, put in some stuff, and I've got the most important fields in electromagnetic field theory, uh, electromagnetism. They just showed up. That's bizarre. This is a gauge field. And it's actually easy enough to wipe it out. Uh, let me show you how you do that. You go... Uh, I'm going to use a box now for this. I'm going to go down to my now kind of unified, put put them all in the same box kind of thing, and then you go minus box a the conjugate of that. Okay, that will wipe out this gauge field. Cool. All right. Now we say, well, what if I were to can I get e can I get even more? And and I w this is something I noticed. I noticed. Well, what if you got a minus b field? Well, how would you do that? Um, well, what if you switch the operators around? Okay, so so that it was kind of like maybe because because this is the only thing that would flip signs, um, and so I define something I call <clears throat> the Hebrew operator, and I'll symbolize that with this arrow. So that means you actually are going, writing this down as A DT, but the DT really acts on A, okay? And again, we'll wipe out the, uh, the gauge field that you get with this Hebrew operator, as I'm calling it, Hebrew differential operator. Um, so, so even though it's, it's written A like that, you're still taking derivatives of the A thing. All right. Hope that's clear. Now, if you do that, then uh, that purple pen looks awful. So let's uh, 
you get let's see we had 0 minus e plus b and here this guy would generate 0 minus e minus b all right now form that product so you go first oh nothing minus last okay so i get a Oh, we get cross terms, they cancel. So I only get this difference of cubes and that's a minus b squared, but it's also an i thing. So it's the minus thing. So you get b squared minus e squared. And then you get um, this cross product. Now, why is that interesting? That's amazing <laughs> because this is a Lorentz invariant quantity which when you apply the Euler-Lagrange equations gives you the Maxwell source equations, Gauss's equation and Ampere's law. And this is fascinating because it is Poynting's vector, which is something that tells you about the energy density of, of an electromagnetic field. So all we did was fill out the zeros on taking the derivative of a complete um, kind of uh, space-time number uh, function, and we ended up on a rather quick road to the Maxwell equations, the source equations. So that, to me, it shows the remarkable power of space-time numbers. Thank you very much.